In 2006, the state of Georgia strengthened its laws to prevent child molesters from exploiting children on playgrounds. Specifically, child molesters were not allowed to live within a thousand feet of schools and playgrounds. The Superior Court in Brunswick convicted George Edenfield in 1997 for molesting two young boys. The parents refused a deal of a trial and moved away. George was sentenced to 10 years probation because it would have been difficult to sentence him to prison without the boys as witnesses. During that decade, George Edenfield lived with his parents downtown on Union Street. The house was several hundreds feet from a playground, which was in clear violation of the new Georgia law. Glynn County authorities told George at the end of August that he had to leave. His failure to do so caused his arrest in September 2006. A month later, the Enfields moved to the Canal Mobile Home Park on Horseshoe Lane, where children of various ages live. Among them was a six-year-old boy named Christopher Berrios. While the 2006 Georgia law prevented sex offenders from living near a playground, there were no restrictions barring child molesters from living near school bus stops. There was a school bus stop very close to the mobile home park, where the Enfields had moved. On Monday, March 5, 2007, George faced Glynn County Superior Court Judge Stephen Scarlett on the charges of having lived too close to a playground. He pleaded guilty, and the judge sentenced him to 10 additional years of probation. A local official familiar with George Edenfield's case asked for a stricter form of probation, but a state official persuaded the court that it was unnecessary. Apparently, during the 10 years of George's probation since 1997, no one had come forward with a criminal complaint against him. Three days later, on Thursday, March 8, shortly after 6.30 p.m., Christopher Berrios was missing. Christopher lived with his father and stepmother in the mobile home park, and his grandmother lived in the same park. The Enfields lived across the street from the grandmother. The path Christopher Berrios took to go from his grandmother's residence to his father's went past the Edenfields trailer. Christopher was last seen skipping toward his home with a toy lightsaber in his hand, but he never reached home. When his stepmother realized Christopher was not at his grandmother's and couldn't locate him, she contacted his father at work to help with the search. They couldn't find Christopher and called the police. Local investigators and Georgia Bureau of Investigation quickly organized search teams and interviewed the residents of the mobile home park. One of the investigators saw a lightsaber in the yard of a mobile home that was in the path that Christopher took to go from his grandmother's home to his father's. The investigator observed that the occupants behaved suspiciously when he asked about the toy. The trailer park housed a number of men with a history of sex offenses including Christopher's father. The following week, investigators found Christopher's body in trash bags in a wooded area. The boy had been raped anally and orally and choked to death. One sex offender stood out as a prime suspect, George Edenfield. George's father, David Edenfield, was also an offender who had sexually assaulted a member of his family, specifically his own daughter. The elder Edenfield admitted that he and George had lured Christopher into their home. The two men raped and sodomized the boy, while Peggy Edenfield watched and masturbated. The Edenfields believed that after the horrific sexual assault, their only chance of avoiding detection was to kill the child and dispose of his body. David Edenfield told authorities that as his son strangled Christopher, he put his hands over George so that he could feel what it was like to participate in a killing. I guess it was just instinct. I just wanted to see what it felt like to choke somebody, said Enfield, who initially denied squeezing the boy's neck. After Christopher was dead, Enfield said he, George and Peggy Enfield sexually gratified themselves. Christopher was dead. I guess it excited all of us, Enfield said. Enfield said he didn't know how the boy got into their home, 
but George had him in his bedroom, where he stripped off his clothes before sexually assaulting him. Christopher was crying, not screaming, just kind of scared. He was saying, no, stop, 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 while George put his hands around his throat and choked him, Enfield said. The boy struggled and tried to push George's hands away. George grabbed and held the boy's hands behind his back so he couldn't fight or escape while being sodomized, then strangled. One woman reluctantly gave an interview about what kind of person George was. From her perspective, there was something wrong with him. She didn't know whether he was mentally ill, developmentally challenged, autistic, or a combination of those conditions. His behavior was abusive and frightening. She was terrified of him. She wouldn't even drive her car past his house after the threats he had made to her. One day, when she was in her front yard, he came over to her with hedge clippers in his hands and a look of sheer hatred in his eyes. I'm gonna cut your bush, he said as he opened and shut the clippers close to her abdomen. She backed away from him quickly, got into her house and locked the door. It wasn't the first time that he harassed her banging on the door with his fists and yelling obscenities. The people that lived there fell into two different camps when asked about George Edenfield. They all knew that there was something permanently wrong with him, given his inexplicable bursts of anger and rude behavior. Some of the residents felt sorry for him and his parents, but others were afraid of having him live with them. His parents had told the neighbors that George was fine when he took his medicine, and that he was harmless. George had stalked and propositioned two teenage boys, and waited for them at the bus stop frequently in the afternoons when they came home from school. They did not know he was a convicted child molester. The mother of one of the teenage boys George had propositioned, told that when her husband found out he was going to kill George. The caretaker of the trailer park and the boy's mother had talked the husband out of taking any action. The family had experienced some trouble with the authorities in another state and did not want it known to the park owner. When the father of the other teenager George had stalked first heard of it, he said he was ready to give George a good beating. Instead, he counseled his son to ignore George and not be friendly and polite to him. The father also mentioned that he didn't want any violence on his part to result in having the park owner ask his family to leave. As the residents of the park learned what the Edenfields had done to Christopher and the history of their sexual offenses, they were infuriated that George had been in court several days before the murder. The justice system had failed them. George should have been locked up for his parole violation not just given 10 more years of probation. If that had happened, Christopher Berrios would still be alive. He persuaded his friend Donald Dale to help conceal the crime by wrapping him in plastic trash bags and lying to the police. George, David, and Peggy Edenfield were all accused of Christopher's abduction and murder. A fourth person, Donald Dale, originally charged with tampering with evidence and concealing a body, has since pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of lying to police. Superior Court Judge Stephen Scarlett accepted the plea and transferred Dale to a mental health facility and banished him from Glynn County. Peggy Edenfield testified in the case against her husband David and agreed to testify against her son George during his trial. In exchange for her testimony, Peggy avoided the death penalty. She was eventually sentenced to 60 years in prison. The trial of David Homer Edenfield began on September 29, 2009, and ended on October 5, 2009. The prosecution relied heavily on Edenfield's videotaped confession and his wife's testimony. Dr. Jamie Downs, the medical examiner who performed Christopher's autopsy, also testified to the extent of trauma found on the body and also the manner of death, which Edenfield's taped confession corroborated. Closing arguments began on the fifth day, and the jury was sent to deliberate that afternoon. <laughs>
on October 5 with only two hours of deliberation, the jury returned with a verdict of guilty on all counts. On October 6, David Edenfield was sentenced to death. In 2023, David Edenfield was still awaiting execution. On August 3, 2010, George Edenfield was ruled mentally incompetent to stand trial and was committed to a state mental hospital for evaluation. 